You yep. might not be able to tell us too much because it hasn't aired yet, but Coronation Street, we're waiting yes. for your beautiful face on Coronation Street. Yes. Tell us all about so, it. Th this is really recent. So I filmed I filmed a bit for Coronation Street. But you know, when I when I got when I got the gig, I started to, you know, oh, this is what's happening, this is this is what's going on. There's a storyline that's probably kind of rolling out at the moment that one of the characters, Toya, she had a way back when she she got raped and had a baby and then Welcome to Mamwa. I'm Gordy Camp, your host, and this is the podcast that includes you into my most famous song lyrics. He's a middle-aged man with an attitude, and he didn't even have one till he met you. That's right, I'm the middle-aged man, and my attitude will chatter us through all things that I'm passionate about, from spirituality, the gym and fitness, food, traveling, and music or movies. Quick disclaimer, this list is not exhaustive. So you can get on or you can get off and join us for the episodes that you like the sounds of. Dip in or dip out, as long as you keep dipping. Either way, we've got something to say and we're going in three, two, one day we're treading the boards in drama school and when we graduate we're thrown into the world of work, auditions and starting our own productions. Today we are joined by one of my good mates who I've known since those days of drama school, Dave Kikedia. Thanks for joining us today, Dave. How have you been? Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Uh, I've been all right. I haven't. We've had a little little brief chat before, but uh, yeah, hasn't been too bad at all. You've been navigating the the world of uh, of acting and filmmaking and being a creative and all the other things that go in between. Yeah, there's so much for us to talk about today. Um, so, for the listeners, it's been about 14 years, roughly. It's 2008 since we completely wrapped up our drama school days. Um, but when I was thinking about this chat, Dave, I was actually thinking, and I don't know if you remember this, but do you remember in the first couple of weeks at drama school, we had a talk and they'd invited like filmmakers in to tell us what the world of work was going to be like and what we should like, what we should expect by the time we'd finished our course and all that kind of stuff. Can you remember at that time what your idea of being a working practitioner was? All I remember from drama, from drama school, from leaving drama school, I just wanted to. I think I was a bit deluded after leaving drama school. If I'm if I'm honest with you, me too. I was <laughs> um, because I I left drama school thinking that right I'm an actor now and I'm going to get cast in all these amazing projects and I'm going to be not so much be famous. But, you know, people are going to know who I am yeah, yeah. and I'm going to be able to do this um, amazing work everywhere. And that didn't quite happen. Uh, and I think it was because the reality of being an actor and a creative and a filmmaker um, wasn't really kind of put in front of us at the time. And it was just suddenly, oh, crap. It smacks you in the face that you suddenly realise that maybe you're not as good as you thought you were. And there are other... Um, actors out there who've been working in the game for how many years who are kind of, you know, four, five, six, seven levels ahead of you. And it's not just learning your lines and going and reciting them. There's a whole kind of ball game that goes along with that. So I think I was a bit deluded when I left drama school, if I'm perfectly honest with you. Yeah. So I, because I was thinking about this time we were sat in the theatre and we had these owner of production companies come in and say, well, this is what it's like to make a film and this is what we do for auditions. And say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Then you kind of come out and you just go, what the fuck do I do? Yeah. I think that's it. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, yeah. what the hell am I supposed to do now? It's just, yeah. you feel like a bit, a bit of a fish in a shark pond. Um, and and, and, and that, that's the thing kind of touching up on that. So kind of, if I kind of cut to present day, uh, where I so I, I lecture at the screen of film school in, in Digbeth and I tell my I tell kind of the students that that it's very much what you the, the information that you're getting now that information for for us when we were kind of coming up the ranks was non-existent mm -hmm. I wish I I wish I had somebody back then telling me how to navigate the industry or yeah. you know some steps are especially the business aspect of it translating from creative into the business element to it and that never really happened, and I think that would be hugely important for 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 us at that time to kind of, if we had that information. I think there's an expectation that that's what an agent's for. Do you know when you come out of drama school and they're yeah. like, just do what you can to get an agent, because there's there's this kind of again delusion that 
once you've got an agent, everything will just come your way. Yeah. And yeah. it just doesn't work like that. So we're going no. to cover a lot of this um, today yeah. anyway. But based on kind of that idea from that last, as you round up drama school and stuff, based mm. that on your current situation, how does it differ in your approach? Your approach now to your approach back then, what do you think are the main differences in what you do? In terms of approaching acting or getting acting gigs and Either. In the industry. Yeah, and all of it. The big the biggest factor is business strategy. I'm I'm a lot more strategic now than I was back then. And that's happened through trial and error. It's kind of trying things, not working. Actually, this worked two steps forward, then you get knocked backwards. So it, I'm very much more strategic now. Um, things like you know, at the time, you know, when we were when we were kind of leaving drama school, there wasn't kind of Instagram. Facebook was around, but there wasn't Instagram. There wasn't the kind of the access and the availability you have kind of on social media platforms. But just things like um, knowing a casting director, uh, a producer, watching your favorite show. Okay, I like I like this show. Who's the casting director? Going on IMDb, going on LinkedIn, all those. All the I I still do all those things now. And I send those emails out to the casting director or to the production company with my latest uh, spotlight showreel or headshots and say, look, you know, this is who I am. I'm still I'm still very much available. Um, and, I, and, I, and I constantly, you know, sometimes you don't get a response back. Sometimes you get a generic one back. But I still constantly churn out those emails and knock on those doors and try and network and communicate as much as possible. Um, that is that's definitely what I'm doing now that I didn't do back then and I wish I knew that back then because I would have been a lot quicker and sooner yeah. and had and and I think I wish I was a lot more proactive back then as well I wasn't proactive enough I kind of thought okay I've left drama school I've got an agent now it's just going to happen not the case no not the case now you've then, got to hustle uh, also when it comes to that hustle when something comes up you get you get a role you get a a tour you get like a three-week job whatever it is things like that end up being put on the back burner and you end up like a month behind three weeks behind because you're currently working on one thing it's just there isn't a consistent timeline of how to get things done and yeah. like i mean what you're doing like spoiler for the listeners when you've kind of honed a skill and it's obviously working, and we'll kind of surprise the listeners in a bit with some of that stuff. Um, but it does take time, and hopefully today, for the people listening, we can use some of your advice to kind of not help them bypass some of the stuff, but to streamline their tasks as well. Yeah. I think that's going to be really useful. Um, so in the last 15 years, without going too much into detail, like how, what have you done? in the last 15 years that got you from those two points? Like what, what are those skills and tasks that you've been putting in place? So in, in terms of the, the, the film, filming side of things, the, the, the acting side of things, it was, it was create and make, you know, as, as creatives and as actors and filmmakers and, you know, musicians, you know, sometimes it's, it's difficult, you know, your skin, yeah, and you're watching your friends go off on holidays and it's like shit you know i can afford i can afford three hours in my bear somewhere and that's about it yeah um so it's it's that it's that fine balance of of sustaining life bringing in investment bringing in finance and at the same time kind of nurturing your your creative um your juices you know you you want them to you want them to very much flow as well um so so probably 2011, 12. So I've got I've got um, a very good a very good friend of mine called called Sunny. We met doing a play after just after we left uh, drama school, um, and I remember I was doing I was on a radio a radio show, and I was hosting a a really low budget ten at night to one o'clock in the morning radio show about about it was called the uh, the, the love show. Okay. Um, yeah, and you know you know my listeners were taxi drivers and prisoners. That's pretty much it, um, and. I get a phone call from from Sonny saying, "Listen, I've I've got this project I want to get off the ground. I've I've created this this production company. Um, let's try and make and create something." And that's how that's how I stayed in the industry because I wasn't getting acting gigs. I wasn't getting cast in anything. I was being a part of my own projects or mm -hmm. projects that I was I was involved with with, with kind of friends and colleagues. Um, so that's how I stayed involved in the in the industry, and that's how I kept training, and that's how I kept kind of the creative juices flowing, so to speak. Um, and at the same and at the same time, 
self-taping, auditioning. And then all of a sudden things start, you know, a momentum starts building up and, you, you know, you start getting one gig after another. Uh, but the thing is, you have to, you just have to, you have to keep at it. Even a three, three to six month gap in this game, you, you start from square one again. Yeah. And just to backpedal a, a, a bit, you mentioned watching everyone else do things in their life when we can't oh. do it, right? How do you keep that motivation when you're like, oh, for God's sake, they're getting, they, they're off doing this and they're off doing that and I can barely put two bits of bread together because I'm yeah. trying yeah. to keep my jobs going. What do we do? I, I, I think it's the it's the it's the it's the the goal of being an actor because my my goal was never to be famous and it is not really to be famous it's to work consistently yeah, yeah. in this industry and that's what I that's what I want to do and I want to get better and better and work with better people all the time and bigger production values so that was that's always the that's always the game and yeah it can get frustrating and yeah you can get really annoyed and pissed off that you know what he's off to the Maldives for three weeks and you see Instagram you know like with with the champagne and you know they're sitting on a um, a sun lounger in you know in the Caribbean somewhere, but I think you rein yourself in. You're, yeah. You've got to, got to you, you've got to kind of check yourself and say you know that's an Instagram, that's social media. You don't know what's happening in their life, in their existence. Yeah, yeah. Um, keep keep focus on your goal, and and keep maintaining the small steps to towards that. And there are going to be the ups and downs and knocks, and there are going to be times where you know, as an actor yourself, when you self take, you know yourself that for every 10 self tapes you send in, you might get one. And, and, and sometimes for every 10 self tapes you send in, you might not get any. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you grow that thick skin very quickly. And talking about social media as well, like, especially in this industry, I, I've got a good way for me personally, I've got a good way of reminding myself when I'm seeing people off doing A, B, C or D, I'm like, because I know what the journey is like, I remind myself, I don't know how long it's taken them to get that yeah. well done for them like good yeah. for them because it may have taken a few years to get to yeah. get to that yeah. so good for you yeah. and and also the other thing is nine times out of ten who you're comparing yourself to is totally different to your 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 type so you know if you're getting jealous that a 25 year old blonde girl has got a gig on a bbc show okay fine great you know let's give her let's give her a round of applause but she hasn't taken a job away from you as a you know 38 40 year old whatever it is you are so you know there i can understand that that slight envy yeah, but at yeah. the same time it's you know it, it was you were never in line for that same gig so you know separate yourself from it yeah definitely so the first thing i want to talk about is i'm confused because i'm trying to figure out was that a tv series online series or was that a tv film guilty pleasures so um, Guilty Pleasures was a, a TV series. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, it was, as I said, so I, me I mentioned um, my good friend, Sonny. So Sonny is the creator. He he wrote Guilty Pleasures, and it was about the child grooming cases okay. of Sheffield and Rotherham. Uh, and it was, ba it, was a, it was based around that, that topic, and it was from the, the perpetrator's perspective and how that impacts on their lives and everyone kind of asso mm -hmm. associated with them. Um, so we created a pilot, so the, it was a 50 minute pilot, which is on, on YouTube. You can feel free to watch that. Um, and then there was, I believe, I believe Sonny's written a couple of series, uh, three series written. And then there was a series, uh, season one kind of sizzler. Um, we filmed that and then it was a case of trying to package that and pitch that to production companies and try and get larger production companies attached to that um so we can and that's and that's where we are in the process when we first made it i think timing was a bit was not the right time because everything was quite raw in turn because it was you know it was still happening and it mm -hmm. still is but it was in the news and it was very much uh, um center stage um and a lot of production companies that we approached didn't want to touch it you know they, they were kind of i think they were, they were wary of uh of tackling that subject matter so so quickly yeah um whereas now whereas now it's 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 almost come full circle a little bit more where production companies especially um because it's from south asian filmmakers and content creators um as much as as much as uh it might pain some people you know there's a lot of box ticking exercises when it comes to these things yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and 
and I think we somewhat tick a lot of those boxes. So at the moment, it's it's kind of rejuvenated and it's started to production companies are starting to take a look at it more to see if it gets gets financed and to take on a bit more because you can try and you can try and self make, uh, which we did to a certain extent. But you at certain at a certain point you need that extra muscle. You yeah, need yeah. that. You need that that finance. You need that that extra kind of bit of creativity, the, the that backing of a large production house to kind of say, right, you know, we're with you. Let's kind of who who have got a track record on history. Um, a lot of these TV production companies will only finance you, will only kind of push you forward if there's someone attached to you who they can trust. If you're a first time yeah. filmmaker or production company who hasn't really made anything, it's difficult for them to kind of you know place a bet on you. Yeah, I think it could be seen as like quite biased to come from a specific type of production company yeah. to tell that story as well. Is this the same story as Three Girls? Sim- so s- similar, that was from the um, victim's perspective. Okay. Um, and in fact, in fact, we had we had a cast member uh, who was in Guilty Pleasures, was also in Three Girls as well. So there okay. was a little bit of a, um, a, a crossover there. But yeah, very much, very much in that, in that subject matter and that and that topic, yes. Okay. Um, so just for anyone who's not who's not aware of it, who's listening, there was a I can't remember what production company think, or what I think channel. It was BBC, I think it was BBC. Uh, yeah, I think you're right there. Um, there was a TV show called Three Girls, um, which kind of told this story from um, about child grooming. Um, yeah, and it was quite a very large case, um, and it was I think at the time. When that came out, it was groundbreaking. But like I say, it was only yeah. from the victim's perspective. Um, and again, it was from a white perspective, I feel. Yeah. Because it involved white families, white children. It wasn't... It's talking about yeah. South Asian, it's like I felt like that was very one-sided with three mm-hmm. girls. Um, but that's just from my perspective of watching it. Yeah. Um, so... Patient fifty two. Then tell me about, about yeah. this. So, so patient again. Patient fifty two was uh, was very much a. It's almost a quite an experimental film. You have to watch it a few times to okay. kind of get the, get the nuances. Well, the nuances we thought that we added to it. Uh, but again, this was uh, written by uh, by Sunny, um, and it was very much um, a social experiment type of type of film. How people in a confined space. Uh, who live the same day repeatedly, um, who live the same uh, actions, how they kind of, how it affects their existence. Um, so it was, it, it was kind of set in an asylum and they had, we had kind of, I think at one point we had like 80 cast and crew. Okay. Um, so I guess that's on Amazon Prime as well. So that's, uh, you probably have to watch it a few times just to kind of uh, uh, pick up what's happening here and there. But again, okay. it was, it was fun. To, it was, it was fun to. It's a bit of a Marmite film, but it was fun to film, and it was it was fun to kind of be involved in that, especially that much of a um, a cast and crew. You know, when you've yeah. got like you know seventy, eighty people on set at one point, and you're kind of trying to you're you're trying to act, you're trying to direct, you're trying to uh, produce at the same time. It's uh, it's kind of you know you're switching hats left, right, and center. I mean, just thinking about the difference in production and how it works, going from a production that size, and I believe. That, that you were on a documentary, Channel Four. Yes, yes. Um, was that a smaller yeah. scale production with that somebody was. following you around? <laughs> that was, yeah. So, so what I'm was that? To give you some, so the the documentary was a Channel Four documentary called "Extremely British Muslims." Yeah. yeah. So I've got a friend called I've I've got a friend called um, Ash, and Channel Four were actually uh, they made these three part three part documentary. And the middle one was about um, Muslims um, finding love, you know, navigating the world of, you know, romance, etc. And they actually they they centered um, one of the storylines ar- um, around a good friend of mine called Ash, and they were they were following him around, um, and then they wanted a a soundboard of a, like a, a friend to come in, and so they could kind of ask questions and that's how I got involved you know purely kind of coincidental and that's how I got involved in that but it just it turned out to be so much fun because what what they aired and what actually was happening 
was just totally different, you know. <laughs> oh, that was that nice. was a that was a fun uh, that was a fun production being involved in. But it was just it was a kind of skeleton crew. It was <laughs> producer, um, kind of the host Paddy and the camera person. That was it. And sometimes it was just Paddy with the camera. Yeah. And then you had right. um, a role on Doctors. I did, yes. So I did, yes. So uh, sadly, Doctors. I'm, and I'm really, I'm really sad about this. Do- yeah, me doctors too. Doctors has gone, but that that's you know it was, it's for Midlands actors. You know, it was kind of rite of passage. You know, yeah. you've got to you've got to be on Doctors somewhere, whether it's an extra, whether it's supporting artist, or whether it's kind of a featured role. Get on Doctors. Yeah. Um, uh, and this was after you know I'd I'd done many many kind of supporting artist role for doctors i was a cop and i was a nurse and i was you know dog walker five and you know uh, waiter number 17 that kind of thing and then um and then i then i got i got a guest appearance so i played this uh character called anish rupani who was uh you thought he was the you know he was the bad guy and he was abusing his wife and he was uh you know taking advantage advantage of her and really kind of being hostile towards her but in fact it was because the wife was a gambler and she'd lost thirty thousand pounds of their money and lost their home, and um, he was just trying to save his save his family. So production size, like yeah, I think I know the answer because I've been on set of doctors anyway. But for the listeners, what's the difference in production size from what you'd been working on with Patient Fifty Two or the documentaries? I think the, the, the obviously. With, with doctors, I think they they film in blocks, and they were filming a couple of episodes at a time. Um, I think the biggest thing is is the turnover in time. It's really quick. It's almost mm-hmm. like an, an assembly assembly line, like a factory. You you come in, do the scene. They've probably got a couple of cameras filming one way. Um, you run the scene a few times. If it's clear, great, clear, turn around, and then they switch it. And then that that was pretty much it. Yeah. In terms of Rehearse, they might you might rehearse lines a couple of times, but in terms of hold on, I just need to find my character, and you know, exactly. um, you know, I just need to, what's what's the motivation here? There's none of that. There's yeah, no, <laughs> you you try that on set, they'll look at you like you know, oh god, yeah, because you know their turnaround is so high, and time is kind of money. Yeah, so you know you need to kind of come in, hit the ground running. I think that was the biggest thing in production. Yeah, Patient Fifty Two because it was our own production, it was a bit more kind of lenient you can put more into it though can't you like yeah yeah very much so but with doctors it was like you know right you've got you've got your lines learned okay let's go let's do a couple of line runs great let's put you in situ um right let's let's roll yeah two times switch two times clear done sounds good yep done okay right let's move to the next one yeah i had um, a voiceless feature support and role on doctors and it was a delivery driver right yeah and uh they were like, oh, we're going to film from 7 a.m. Get here for 6.30. Great. Yeah. 7 a.m. on the dot, right? Where's our delivery driver? In, filmed. I was gone by 7.15. Yeah. I was just like, that's a good job. Like, yeah. Some of them, you'd wait all day to do yeah. to do a, like, a support yeah. and roll, and you just sit there all day for that last 10 minutes. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a bonus, yeah. like... I, I've I've had I've had it both. I exactly the same. I've gone in kind of like at seven, and yeah, by you know eight thirty nine. You know, it's all right. Thanks very much. You're done. Um, and I've had it the other way. I've kind of had to stay on set for like you know eight hours, and then they've used me for five minutes at the end. Yeah, absolute ball ache. But you know that that's you know it's part and parcel of the game. Just take, take a good book with you and a good podcast. Like exactly, this. isn't it? Yeah. That's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> Um, okay, so BBC to ITV, you yeah. might not be able to tell us too much because it hasn't aired yet, but Coronation Street, we're waiting yes. for your beautiful face on Coronation Street. Yes. Tell us all about so, it. Th- this is really recent. So I filmed I filmed a bit for Coronation Street uh, about three weeks ago. So uh, it's mid-June. I do know the date, but I don't know the date. Um, it will be yeah, it will be airing, I think, mid-June, first, second week of June. Um, and this was, it's, I play, again, it's, uh, I played a duty solicitor. Okay. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm not, you know, a huge Corey fan as such. Um, but you know, when I, when I got, when I got the gig, I started to, you know, oh, this is what's happening. This is, this is what's going on. There's a storyline that's probably kind of rolling out at the moment that one of the characters, Toya, she had a way back when she, she got raped and had a baby. And then 
um, she gave birth to the baby and kind of buried it or something. And that's the kind of storyline. It's quite, you know, graphic. Yeah, I remember know. that because I wasn't even... Being at drama school was like wasn't even in my mind at that time. And I used to watch all the soaps day and night. I just used to love it. I remember that storyline, yeah. Well, that, that storyline's kind of come back and it's kind of re resurfaced again. And I play her lawyer. So, but I'm, I'm, I, I did one episode. I've got another couple coming in the end, towards the end of the year. So I think the kind of, I'll be coming in and out. So it's, yeah, Coronation was really, really kind of nice to work on. Again, very much in the similar vein to Doctors, very much uh, really factory like going, hit the ground running, you have to. Um, three cameras, shoot one way, clear, turn around, shoot the scene again, and that's it, you're done. Yeah. Multiple that's episodes a week, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It just bish bash bosh. Yeah. Tell us a bit about your Cannes Film Festival, Footprints on Water. Yeah. So Footprints on Water was my my first international international film. Um and it's gone around the festivals at the moment. Actually, let me let me kind of backtrack a bit more. So it was written uh by um two sisters. Uh, Nita and Nat Siam. Um, and the story is about um, an illegal immigrants that have come from Sri Lanka and India to the UK, specifically Birmingham. So it was, part, it was kind of, uh, I think, probably 60% filmed in Birmingham, the other kind of 40% in, in India. Yeah. And, and it's about uh, a set of illegal, illegal immigrants that come over to the UK. And it's how they um, settle into life here. Um, and they hook up with this dodgy solicitor who takes their passports and he's um, illegally mining them out to kind of, you know, do low budget work, yeah. um, low pay. My character, I play a character called Vikram who's come over from Sri Lanka, but I've had to leave my daughter there. Um, so I've come over with my wife and we're trying to get our, uh, we're trying to get our daughter to come uh, bring our daughter to the UK. Uh, and we enlist the help of this uh, solicitor who kind of double crosses us eventually um doesn't fork out the money and long story short our daughter you know perishes in in Sri Lanka but the main lead is uh, a guy called Adil Hussain um you probably recognize him from Star Trek um Life of Pi lots of Bollywood stuff he's a very he's a very kind of um art house actor uh, but just being on all my scenes were with him and just to kind of act opposite someone like that was just amazing because I, I probably the, the learning curve that I had just from that film was just ridiculous. Just to kind of how to conduct yourself on set, approaching a character, the nuances, the emotions, um, how to kind of dissect the script, you know, the backstories, what's you know, what's happening, where, where's, where's the journey going after this. Um, and it was just to be involved in a production of that size and to be involved in the production that was filmed in in Birmingham at the same time it was just was just kind of an honor to be part of that production and, and it's it's done it's done really well uh, kind of on the festival circuit yeah that's good so just before we kind of talk about the the festivals um how does that story align with your because we talk a lot about culture in some of our episodes as well yeah. how does that align with your your background personally like what's your, what is your background for the listeners and how does that align? So, so, you know, I'm South Asian, Indian background. Um, and it, it does resonate because these were illegal immigrants from the, the South, you know, South Asian subcontinent. Um, and I, as I said, I've been from kind of inner city Birmingham as well. So, you know, I've, I've seen people who have come over, who have come over illegally, legally as refugees, asylum seekers, and the struggles that they have, they are facing very much here. You know, we just have to look at what's happening in the news at the moment with, you know, with the the, the the Rwanda bill, for example, you know, from kind of, from from our perspective, it's all well and good that we can kind of sit in this safe space, relatively safe space, and, you know, not have that that worry and that impact. But someone, you know, who might, who might be uh, shipped off to Rwanda, you know, people coming yeah. on those small boats, you know, for an actual reason, Whatever you think their reason is, whether it's kind of you know politically charged or whether it's kind of financially charged, there's a reason why they why they're doing that. So especially people from the South Asian subcontinent, from India, Pakistan, from Sri Lanka, 
um, you know, that's, you know, I look like them and it's, it's, I know these people. So it, it was, it was, it's, it was very kind of, um, from an actor's perspective, it was great playing someone with those emotions and someone, and it was, and for me to try and connect with that was, was the challenge. And from an acting perspective, you know, it's the challenge, it's those type of challenges that you want. Yeah. And these are stories that need to be told. Yeah, absolutely. Like, without question, they have yeah. to be told. Um, and I love to see them being told. Like as a, from a cultural perspective, whether it's with yourself in this film or Spanish people and yeah. Spanish culture. So I love cultural films like yeah. the French, the German, the Spanish, like yourself, South Asian. Like, and I'm I'm completely into it, but it's not widespread enough sometimes. Yeah. And these stories need to be heard and need to be told. Yeah. Um, and what I'd just like to add with this film, the the other kind of you know cherry on the cake was that it was it was written and directed by by two females, you know, two South Asian females, and to kind of there's not many you know platforms available for two South Asian females to produce a film and to create a film of, of of this size as well. So to have their voice heard and to work with kind of female directors i've worked with a few female directors but you know to work with a female director on kind of this capacity and this this scale yeah um was kind of was was really enjoyable amazing it's good to hear so with footprints on water then what if the film festival is 2022 is that right 2022 2022 23 23 23 um I think. so what's the journey of the film been from the film festival sure. to where it is now. So it, it debuted at Cannes um, and then it went around kind of the major uh, film festivals around the world. So it, it, it did Toronto, it's done Berlin. It, st- it's, it did um, a couple of the, the Indian ones in New York, Asian Film Festival, UK Asian Film Festival. So it's still, it's still kind of in the festival circuit, but I think it's coming to its end because I heard recently that they it's going to be released so I don't know whether it's going to be released on uh, on any on Netflix or Amazon Prime or any of those platforms, or if it's going to go into um, be released at cinema. But it will be released, I believe, autumnish this year. Okay, good good news. Um, so did you make it to Cannes? I didn't know. You didn't know no, because didn't, I was I going to ask. Um, I didn't if the red carpet was as vicious as it seems to be this year. Have I you heard do, about the, the nonsense? No, no. So basically, Kelly Rowland got ushered off the red carpet really yeah. aggressively. Um, and she had a massive go at one of the the ushers, the security ushers. And then there was a Dominican actress, Marcial Taveras, yeah. who ha- went through the exact same thing. And she shoved the security guard. And I was like, the reason I'm saying that, I was going to ask, is it as vicious as they make it sound in the press? But I'm saying it now, but I will be going next year. Yeah. I will be going next year. I, I was, yeah, I was, I was, I was really supposed to go this year, um, but yeah, just kind of dates aligned. I, I couldn't get out a few things, but I will be going next year. Oh, bro! Well, if you got a spare ticket, give me a shout. I'll do a report so on it. Yeah, let's go together. Let's go together. Let's go together. You can do <laughs> with you. There we go. Um, yeah, but go and check that out because Kelly Rowland and we'll do, yeah. Marcial Taveras. Like, uh, it's I've just been glued to that story. I'm like. I know the French can be aggressive, but come on, this is getting a bit much. Two and a half minutes was up with an award as well, wasn't it? Your film. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So uh, again, um, two and a half, two, two and a half minutes, a short film written by uh, Sonny, um, and it was, it was, it was a nice, real kind of. I think it's about seven, eight minutes piece of work. It was. It's. It's about a couple. Um, we were having dinner, and the the guy has fire has found out that she's been she's been seeing someone else, okay. but unbeknownst to her, I won't give it too much away. But unbeknownst to her, he's invited him around already, and he's upstairs uh, in the bath, dead, and uh, and they they're having this conversation. She doesn't believe him, and then she you know she runs upstairs, finds him there, and then he slowly um, walks up the stairs, and you know ends her as well 
Uh, so yeah, it's 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 a, it's a nice little it's a it's a nice little film. But the, what's great about it, it's got loads of layers and loads of nuances. There's a TV, there's an old 1920s film playing in the background, and that relates to everything that's being said. And okay. the music connects with their, music connects to um, the the dialogue, um, all the pictures, um, the volume that goes up and down. It, it's it's a very it's a very cool new nuanced film actually. It's uh, I I do like that film, and it has won a couple of awards. It got uh, Sonny a a few um, a best actor nominations as well. Amazing. Good. Well, if you're listening, you don't need to watch it now because you know, what, I know yeah. you know what happens. <laughs> I'm I'm I'm, re- I'm really crap at kind of you know giving people cliffhangers. I just tell people what's going on so they don't watch it. Saves them time. <laughs> You're currently lecturing at the Screen and Film School. Yes. So when you're lecturing, then t- thinking about what we've kind of discussed so far, what is the top struggles that you see your students dealing with when they want to get into film? And I think the the biggest struggles that they face is, and I think to a certain extent is what we faced, is getting is getting onto film sets and getting an industry and getting the work experience. I think that's the that's the that's the biggest thing because the students are very capable. They know, you know, whether it's writing, cinematography, whether it's directing, you know, they can put something together. That's not that's not the the issue. The issue is getting them onto getting them into a space where they could hone their craft a bit more. Um, and, I th- and I think bridging that gap is very much the difficulty. Um, and that comes down to them sometimes, you know, you, I, and again, like, as we as we spoke about earlier, it's about the hustle. Mm-hmm. It's about the communication. It's about networking. You almost have to kind of be quite brash about getting yourself onto, getting yourself onto a set. And I think that is yeah. the, that's the biggest difficulty. Um, but at the same time, Maybe this is a question for you. I mean, when when we were at drama school, especially when when we were going through the process, I all I wanted to do was just act. I, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to learn as much about it as possible, and I would take roles which I didn't really want to take. I'd take roles that maybe I shouldn't have. I would take roles that I I, I would just take everything that that came uh, because I wanted to learn and absorb. What I feel sometimes is, is this new kind of, and I don't want to say generation, but it is what it is. This new generation of kind of actors, artists, they're, they're, they're very much a lot, they're a lot quicker to question, oh, I don't want to do this because it affects, you know, my belief is this. Yeah. So, for yeah. example, like, I one of my first gigs when we were at drama school, I did this, I played a terrorist, you know, and we went to drama school kind of mid 2000s, you know, not too long after 9 11, you know, I looked, you know, I was in my early 20s. I looked like who I look like, and I was prime suspect number one. But I embraced the the terrorist role because no one else is going to be able to play it. So I'm going to take this role and I'm going to really kind of utilize it. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I think a lot of roles are questioned now. Well, I don't want to do that because I, um, you know, I'm, I don't agree with that kind of political view, or I don't believe, or don't believe in that kind of that that standpoint, that stance, which is fine. But from my perspective, if you want to be an actor. Can act exactly. Yeah, I'm I'm with you there. I don't know if you can remember this, but my background was in production anyway, and yeah. I did broadcast law and broadcast production. I'd been to film school and stuff. Um, in my early twenties, everything had changed by the time I went to drama school. Um, but again, I was about the role, and very much in the vein of what what you're saying, when you hear of old school acting. Do you like the script? Do you resonate with the script? And can you portray that character? Yeah. Like, it's not about, I don't agree with what you're saying. It's not, I don't know. I'm very much with you on that. Like, I I wouldn't say, I disagree with what you've put in the script, so I'm not going to do it. Yeah. It's just like, does the script resonate, firstly? Like, is it a challenge? Like if to, yeah. I don't want to be too much of a challenge because if it's too much of a challenge, I won't get a bloody part. Like, <laughs> but will it will it drive me to get that job done? I guess it's just a perception thing, isn't it? I just if you look the part, sound the part, and you get the part, you yeah. should do the job. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, it's not just about beggars can't be choosers, but it's yeah. choose wisely. I mean, like, I think it's choose then, wisely, isn't it? Exactly, and I think that I think that uh, what we've just described there is is a, is slightly different to representation. 
you know, I think what we've described there, representation, kind of runs, hand, it's kind of hand in hand and runs parallel with with each other. But even then, even then, uh, there are, there are sometimes where it's just like, you know what, just if you if you are right for the part and you can get the nuance and you can get the character and you can bring it out of you, play it. Yeah. Play the character. Play the, role. Like, I play think the text. Talking about generational as well, some people won't even go for an audition if they don't agree with it. Yeah. I think they're doing themselves a disservice. Like yeah. they're stopping themselves from succeeding because they're being too judgy on the yeah. role. And I yeah. think that's the only way I would say it really. Like, don't judge a role based on a description. Exactly, and it's and it's hard enough as it is. And you know, trying to trying to get to get through the whole kind of acting game. You know, self tapes as we were kind of discussing. You know, I I sometimes if you you know in ten self tapes you probably only get the first one gig. Yeah. You know, for every ten you get one. So and even then sometimes you know don't don't even get that one. So it's you know the competition is is very high. Yeah. And and sometimes you know putting on my casting director's hat. Sometimes the casting casting directors won't, won't even watch the entire tape. They'll just first ten seconds. Does it look like the person that I I've got in my head? No. Okay, fine. Next one. Yes. Okay, fine. Let's see thirty seconds of this. Yeah. No, it's not good for me. Yeah. So you know, it's it's kind of a it's a split second decision that these casting directors make. And we've touched on this in previous discussions with um, other people in the industry. Like, it's because you don't get something doesn't mean you're not good at what you do. It just means yeah. you're not right for that one part. Exactly, exactly. I have a battle with battle with social media because I don't really like it. I don't really kind of you know, I don't prioritize posting and pictures and stuff. But it is really important in what we do. Yeah. Now yeah. it is, it is. You know, I it's, and I've started to hear a lot more recently. How many followers has this person got? You know, how many, how many you know people are you know in, interacting with this person. Or who are you interacting with as well? So I'm consciously trying to be more active on social media, but That's I just not my thing. The trend of the industry, isn't it? In yeah. Sims, everything. If we're the brand, we need a social media strategy. Yeah. We need a marketing yeah. strategy. So yeah. it's not enough for us to just get the auditions, do the work, get the we, job. Yeah, like we have to do everything else as well. Like, we're everything. We're, we're you know we're we're strategy. We're business development. We're marketeers. We're research. We got to we got to train. You know, at the same time, all this stuff. We got to you got to keep training. You know, yeah, you've yeah. got to keep working with actors, going to workshops, learning how to sight. You know, continue to sight read, dissecting a script, and then you know getting it on stage, getting on its feet. So it's kind of, and then doing then doing all the kind of the network and communication, sending out the email. So it is we've got to be all and everything. Yeah, definitely. That covers everything, Dave. Is there anything, final piece of working advice for our listeners? What would you give them? I think the, 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 the biggest thing is be proactive, hustle, and create and make. I think that that's, I think if you kind of, if, you, if, you're, if you're continuously doing, sooner or later, you will get noticed. Sooner or later, you're, because your production value will increase, the you know your your writing if it's writing or your 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 cinematography or whatever it, whatever your discipline is you know it will just get better it will just get better and better exactly practice makes perfect you hone, exactly. your, hone your skills yeah and yeah and there's, there's there's no there's no shortcut in this no there, unfortunately there isn't you know there is no shortcut you've got to you've got to create and make and just keep continue continue to to practice and train and i think also go into the whole social media conversation it helps us to stay on top of what's happening online. Yeah. Because if we're not constantly creating, we're not staying in touch with what's expected, what the discussions are, what people are looking at, and it just keeps everything with us, I guess. Well, we hope that's been a great insight to the world of professional film. There is a lot more advice where that comes from. Um, so pop yourselves online. Uh, you can follow Dave on Instagram. What's your handle, Dave? It's uh, DK Leandro. DK Leandro. So you can keep up with on upcoming films, roles. Um, Dave, get yourself sorted with social media. Everyone's going to be waiting for updates. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for coming to spend this time with us today. Remember to subscribe to the channel, Gordy Camp, and make sure you don't miss these great conversations. And you can keep the conversation going over on Facebook at Gordy Camp TV and on Instagram and threads at Gordy Camp. 
Until next time, look after yourself and others, and we will see you soon. Bye.